Okay, so uh, this is kind of just like a bonus or added section to this uh, lecture that really doesn't have a tremendous amount to do with the actual process. And um, instead more to do with uh, ways to think about this in um, historical context that doesn't just make it like a very dry kind of formulaic way to build up a figure. Um, and it's something that I've written about more extensively on my blog and posts that are separated to not be overwhelming called or titled, Why Should We Care About Construction? Um, but it's something that you can skip if you're familiar with history and don't want anything that's um, going to get in the way of just kind of focusing now on the, the uh, functional things that we're discussing. Um, so one thing to me that's really interesting and um, I think important about understanding the Renaissance is seeing the exact same um, basic mechanics that we were talking about uh, developed by artists for reasons that are way more profound and interesting than just seeing perspectives. Um, and specifically, what I think you could see clearly in the Renaissance is um, anatomy or study of the figure used as a training tool. Uh, primarily for the study of figure and anatomy as a rite of passage for an artist's development in humanist tradition, uh, or specifically Neoplatonic aesthetics. And, and so in that sense, it's uh, the Renaissance artists, I think, are abstracting the figure into form languages, creating and, and establishing harmony uh, or proportioning geometric forms to create um, harmonies that are derived from um, ideas of mathematical precision coming from, from Plato. So just as a quick uh, background for anybody that, that doesn't have a lot of uh, kind of philosophy, Plato was uh, very much interested in the arts as a way to um, access a metaphysical or ethical um, idea through rational thought. Um, so for him, the arts really only had value in the way that they could correctly represent disorder um, and aid in the alignment of a subject with the metaphysical. Um, and he talked quite a bit about uh, the beauty of form being um, something that is based on circles and squares or solid forms, straight edges, and that those are the things that are always beautiful in and of themselves and embody, um, you know, special artistic type of, of feeling. And so what Plato points to is the building blocks or kind of a sets up the building blocks uh, which um, organic and inorganic form in the Renaissance is founded. And so, I mean, this is one way to think about what we were doing in the sense that this is an emphasis away from the outward appearance of things. It's not about a contour or how something looks. It's uh, placed more so on an underlying logic and it's accompanied, uh, accompanying geometric formula. So Plato sets up an idea or a philosophy in seeing beauty or um, as harmony expressed through specific mathematic proportions, or we could think of this as the golden mean, in order to, within or as a consequence of art, symbolize a larger harmony. So Renaissance artists pick up on that through the work of Vitruvius, right? and that's what you see here as um, Da Vinci's illustrating. So Vitruvius wrote this, uh, these books, the 10 books on architect, architecture. This had a profound influence on not only architectural practices, but the artistic practices of the Renaissance. And um, in, in this book, he breaks down proportion, uh, whether it's for you know, designing columns or uh, structures and buildings, but the human figure is always the underlying template for these designs. Um, and so, Again, with or in Vitruvius, um, we see something very different than a literal translation of the look of the figure as outward appearance, and then applying that outward appearance to a temple. Rather, he's seen abstractly or abstracting the figure into underlying proportional principles that are then used to, to link two radically unlike things, you know, people or buildings. Um, and so this eventually becomes something massively influential for Renaissance artists and is first uh, translated by Alberti. And um, Alberti does um, 
see a ton of influence from uh, Vitruvius's writing and expresses this in his idea of consanitas. And I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but it's basically or loosely defined as um, an idea of uh, the harmony of all the parts fitted together with such proportion and connection that you know, nothing could be added, diminished, or altered. And this becomes a, a paramount or a, a standard way that Alberti starts to see and compose form and proportion. Um, and this is an idea that's consistent with the humanist tradition, um, antiquity, and platonic ideas of, of beauty. Um, and so if we move kind of from that very brief, very loose setup to something like um, Vitruvian Man, that, that Da Vinci is, is developing or drawing here, uh, what we see is in the Renaissance an idea or a practice that is very much articulated or focused at the idea of architecture, right? And, and architecture's blend with the figure and specifically with a dissolve into an added or anatomical study. Um, and so Da Vinci does a lot of perspective drawing or uh, kind of cutouts or um, dissections that are both perspective and, and literal in which he's looking at different areas of the skull or cavities of the heart or um, muscular nature. But he's also interested in the study of anatomy and structure to facilitate an accurate representation of the nude figure um, as well as, as its breakdown right into geometric diagrams, kind of like what we're seeing here. So Vitruvian man can very simply represent a front view or anterior view of a figure that's also surrounded by a circle and a square. And these were kind of just going off of the geometric solids or ideas that Vitruvius described. Um, Vitruvius stated, um, quote, also a square will be found described within a figure in the same way a round figure is produced. So it's kind of like uh, mysterious in its phrasing. And this is something that you could find all or most Renaissance artists trying to reconcile. What we see in Da Vinci's drawing, which is the most famous, I think, representation of the, the Vitruvian man trying to you know, incorporate the figure into geometry, two of the most important shapes used in the Renaissance, right? in the Renaissance and its mathematically inspired interpretation of the world, the circle and the square. And then here, the composite of both. And these are the keystones to design in Renaissance architecture and figure. So what I see in Leonardo's work here is the same thing we're doing, except it's way better. Leonardo's drawing is trying to emphasize a, a contiguity of the human body with geometry in effort to find that same divine harmony between you know, the, the metaphysical and then the terrestrial or kind of the earth um, in proportion. Uh, we could also take that a step further and other writers have. People like um, John Hendricks have written that uh, the square is a traditional symbol of the earth, the circle is a traditional symbol of the divine, and Da Vinci's drawing here represents the ability of man to connect the two, you know, the divine and then the material. Um, and the illustration is a form language. Right? It's describing essential geometries that he's trying to incorporate um, in abstracting from nature. Da Vinci also wrote a lot about kind of a transformation or a plastic molding of one shape into another without changing area or volume. And so I think of this kind of like the, the mental or the three-dimensional sculpture that we, we also try to maintain in our drawings, seeing um, the 2D as as volumetric forms that you can push and pull. So in this sense, there's a very strict logic to the way that geometries or forms in the Renaissance are used to break and analyze and understand and dissect figures uh, that is something beyond some simply copying or contouring. And it's also something beyond just simply representing perspective. Um, a couple more here you could see that show more specifically his involvement with um, dissecting or trying to make 
cutaways in this three-quarter view of the skull. We also see um, the cranial mass sectioned with that outer quarter removed, exposing the interior. On the right side, you see a lateral view of the right leg and him starting to section pieces. Right? This is maybe more a way of technically trying to understand the varying width of, widths of the leg. And again, moving down to see um, changing thicknesses. This is something that we do very much, uh, or I did this week, and looking at the figure as a series of boxes or cylinders. Uh, this is another study by Leonardo to, to help kind of make that point uh, that I introduced, the idea that not only that there's a type of mental sculpture going on in the drawing, but also a transformative interest in the ideas of uh, figurative geometries becoming architectural. And so the emphasis and the important thing to me is that there's the thinking process, is the process of abstraction is what's important, the process of understanding to design. And so for me, the, the right uh, or upper right side of this sketchbook page or drawing looks very much like the rib cage in the way we broke it down as an egg with an opening for the thoracic arch. And as we move down slowly, kind of diagonally from right to the left corner and then back to right again, you see it become in his mind a dome or a column, or I'm sorry, a, um, a lantern for a cathedral. I believe it's the cathedral in Milan. And, and that's something that I want to make sure that um, is taught simultaneously with the technical side of this, just so it becomes um, clear that it's it, not just a technical thing. It can also be something that is, uh, in the way that we laid out gesture, a rational system right, that is geared at an aesthetic principle, or um, in this case, a humanist principle, right, trying to break all things visible into a geometric harmony so that anyone that observes um, architecture and its relationship to painting and sculpture and figures are, are given an idea of that rational underlying logic. Uh, it's also shown here and something more specific in terms of uh, the way that I see in some of his sketches, the, the breakdown of anatomy, which is there on the left, or the dissection or the study of the shoulder region, and how those shapes show up in areas, right? There's a lot of formal similarity in the um, study of the Milan Cathedral. Right, so especially in that kind of triangular section, right, if you look at the, the colored section that's just slightly towards the bottom uh, or the center uh, right of the page, we see that uh, triangular section. It looks very much like uh, the interclavicular fossa on the right, right or the, the structural breakdown between the shoulder and the chest. Um, basically, if you flip that area and fit it, it might match perfectly. So. Things like this allow me to kind of see or study the way in which uh, very similar shapes and designs lead into images, right, and um, are translated or transformed, from just like you saw in the last image from the rib cage diagram to the cathedral. Here we'd have maybe a more interior structural design or shape used for a similar idea, yet on a, on a different scale. Uh, this is another kind of interesting sketch that I like of Da Vinci's that shows um, the breakdown of the throat or a dissection of the throat paired alongside plans for columns. And in this image, it shows uh, similar proportions of kind of the bones of the throat and the cartilage as a departure point for uh, the actual designs of the pillars. And so in this um, sense, it's another example of um, consideration of you know, that idea of proportion and harmony um, aimed at you know, designs hidden within the surface contours of the neck. And by dissection and looking at these things, we see this practice of transformation or a transformative design principle in which you know, the proportion of the throat gradually resolves into this cylindrical mass of the column on the right. And it wasn't something just practiced by da Vinci. We could see it in um, people like Albrecht Durer, who were very influenced by da Vinci's 
proportions and his thinkings about geometry. Um, here, I think in this specific image, you can, you know, just as a way of making a relationship to what we did technically, you can see him planing off the rib cage. You can see him looking at tilts in the pelvis. You can see him positioning that tilt relative to the straight line of the weight bearing leg. And so there's a lot of, kind of shared techniques for abstracting and, and understanding form. Um, but with Sure, you also see this increased interest in um, building the figure out of planar cubes or boxes um, and then using that as a um, architectural abstraction here by creating floor plans right or seeing uh, the figure from these different um, stereometric views uh, on the right you see uh, the same thinking in terms of the cutaway right or the 13 sections of the man that are kind of broken apart or sliced apart in this weird geometric assemblage. Uh, I also included another uh, interesting page from Durer just to show that same, uh, I guess, again, more from the technical side, the grappling with the representation of the figure in these perspective ideas. And so while he kind of lacks some of the eloquence and design and the realization that Leonardo sketches have, um, Durer also has the same shared idea of a form language um, that we've been, or I've been trying to articulate up until this point. Um, and then just a few more, so as not to take up a ton of time in, in discussing too abstract a thing. Uh, there's some really interesting um, similarities or consistencies in these ideas is in Michelangelo's work as well. And um, especially if we look at what's um, there on the left, the sketch of the doorway. Um, what to me is really interesting, and this is a study for the Laurentian Library at San Lorenzo, uh, and I just placed it next to a contemporary, I mean, to a, an anatomical rendering of uh, a detail of one of his figures. Um, but it shows a very interesting mimicking in the proportion and design of the anatomy um, in the way that the doorway is lined out or laid out. Uh, it, thinking in terms of you know, maybe the doorway as the abdomen and then to the sides, the columns representing the obliques and then the bottom of the area of the columns representing the crests of the pelvis, the top portion representing the pectoralis or the trapezius and the curvature above shows, at least to me, that same idea of thinking abstract and proportion in design of anatomy um, being translated or transformed into the doorway. Um, and so even though there's a bit of a contrapposto on the right, to me, the proportional principles are almost exactly the same. And so geometric um, studies or thinking geometry in the Renaissance not only has uh, this perspective ability, it also has this more deepened connection to uh, ideas of antiquity and humanism, and it also serves beyond that as a transformative element, right, where the, the Renaissance artists are able to take ideas of uh, form and design and the figure and transfer and translate that into other elements, um, be it architecture or sculpture. Uh, and then this last one I included think is just kind of fun and interesting. Uh, it is Michelangelo's study for the basis of the pillar in the new sacristy. And it shows um, some columns and profiles, three. And then on that bottom right one, you see a, a dramatic expression uh, that it looks like he used to resolve the silhouette. And so here there might not be that kind of more traditional or structured transfer of proportion or geometry. But it's still that same idea of thinking uh, the figurative as departure or the figure as departure for, in this case, silhouette or design of that um, pillar base. So uh, hopefully this has some clarity. It's not completely opaque in the ideas that I'm talking about. But I just wanted to add it as something maybe to challenge you or to um, elevate the more technical discussion that we went through in terms of the figure and just building it as boxes.